Welcome to the Startup Grind. The Startup Grind is a Google Entrepreneur backed um, platform. We have over 100 chapters all over the world. And so the, the function of Startup Grind is to bring everybody together to network, to meet new people, to shake hands, share ideas. But more importantly, to hear the story of a startup, what I call a startup champion, somebody that's actually in the game, getting busy, actually doing the work of being an entrepreneur. So today, um, this evening, to me, this is a very, very special um, event because one thing about the Tallahassee chapter out of all the other Startup Grind chapters, which I think makes this a little bit special, is you. Not just me. <laughs> I'm pretty cool, but I'm not that cool. There are, there are other directors that are way cooler than I am. But here in Tallahassee, we have a unique dynamic in the sense that we have a lot of different types of entrepreneurs, where a lot of the other chapters kind of focus on tech and the tech startup world because that's kind of like the boom and buzz of being right now. We actually focus on things that are even outside of tech. And tonight, you're going to be able to hear the story of somebody that's not naturally tech. They use tech, and I've actually seen them use technology to do what they do. But it's a very, very interesting craft, which is making candy. You guys like candy? Oh, have you had some of his candy? It's delicious. That's what really I'm going to put his candy on blast. He'll be selling it all over the world because it's really, really all good. Right. All right. <laughs> but to actually hand make candy and the, and the fact that each piece of candy that he makes has like designs in it. It's like really, really cool. And we're going to talk about how he does what he does, how he got started, which is really, really important. Where he's been, where he is today, more importantly, where he's going. He has a lot of dreams. He said one quote back in the back. He said, the things, that I would do, the things that I was doing was not matching my ambition. His ambition is big. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. So without further ado, we're going to introduce Wes. And we're going to hear Wes's story about Ray's Correctionaries. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So you introduce yourself, Wes. Tell everybody who you are and what it is that you do in the name of your business. All right. Well, I know a lot of you guys, but... Um, I'm Wes Rayleigh. Uh, I own a small candy company called Rayleigh's Confectionery. We do handmade hard candies with artwork inside and sell them all over the world. That's good stuff. How many people have, have the, so everybody's actually had a chance to taste this candy. Have you been to a store before? I haven't had a chance to get over to his factory, but I heard it's like phenomenal. You do something really special over there. What is that? Yeah, we, we do a show where, where people who come and visit the factory can, uh, can see the candy being made. And, I'll tell you what, Vince, don't, don't come to my factory tomorrow. Wait, wait a couple weeks, because we're moving. We're moving into a shipping container building. It's the world's first recycled candy factory that oh, I know wow. of. Yeah, and we have, a, we have 12 feet of glass right in front of the most interesting bits of the production line. So you can come up and, and watch how candy becomes sugar like you'd put in your coffee, and then beautiful little pieces of artwork, and it, it, it happens quicker than you'd think. So you said it's recycled. Tell me a little bit more about that. Is it like the shipping container? Yeah, it's like a shipping container? It, it's, like, it's like one of those big, it's eight feet wide, 40 feet long, just perfect for a production line, because it's just a straight shot, you know? Oh, that's really, really cool. Yeah. Has anybody in this room seen that? So I've, I've peeked over and looked at it. It's right around the corner, so you may have driven by it and not even known it. For real? Yeah. We haven't put the big yeah. sign up yet. So what made you go that route? What made you actually get a shipping container and make it your, your factory? I, I've actually dreamed about <laughs> living in a container home since I was like a kid, you know. And um, so that happened and then I got in touch with uh, a guy who has done it before and I talked to him and he was <laughs> like, well, I've done it before. Here's some pictures of what I did and I was like, that's amazing. And he's like, I got this property right next to where you already are. You want to build another one? And I was like, of course I want to build another one. Like, yes, yes, let's make this happen. So um, and that's one of the, you, you mentioned something about Tallahassee being special, and that's one of the really special things about Tallahassee is there's an amazingly collaborative business community. And um, we just cross paths and espouse our love of the idea of a shipping container, and before I know it, this guy is handling all my construction for my shipping container. Oh, that's really sweet. Which is really sweet, yeah. yeah. Cool, we got a sign on everything. We're, we're, we're working on a sign. I'm not, the sign can't come until I'm there. <laughs> I'm not going to put Rayleigh's up until I'm in there. Okay. We've got to finish building it. So you're in the business of candy, and usually I give each one of these talks a title, right? And so this, okay. the, the one that I want to give to this one is a story about developing a craft, old school entrepreneur, entrepreneurship, yo-yos and candy. And you're going to understand why I call it yo-yos and candy as we move forward. Um, he has a really, really interesting story, and I think that it's going to enchant each of you. And if it doesn't inspire, it inspires me because I'm like, this is like real deal. Like, get something to sell it. Entrepreneurship. Um, and so we're going to talk about that. And so we're going to start off with the very first question is, what got you started and why can't you? 
Okay, so um, I, was, I was one of those smart kids in high school um, that, you know, just, I guess because I wasn't the fast kid or the good looking kid, so I ended up being the smart kid. Um, so I went, I think you're good. <laughs> well thank you, it's very flattering. So, 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 you know, I didn't have a lot of direction coming out. Um, my dad was like, well you're smart, you go into med in the medical field. So I went to the pre-med program at UCF um, and I just, I didn't belong there. I'd go into a classroom and see 100 kids that were meant to be there and know that I was the one that wasn't. So um, after a few years, I dropped out and I was delivering pizza and I was kind of thinking about, you know, what does one do for a living? How, do, how does one make a living, you know, as a grown up if I, college didn't work for me, so, so what else, you know, what else is there? And, um, and, I, and delivering pizza is fantastic, but I didn't, want to, I didn't want to do it for the rest of my life. So I sat down on my couch one day, kind of thinking about this, turned on the Food Network, and this dude was making candy. And uh, I just watched him, I kind of amazed, and then um, at the end of the little segment they did, they were like, oh, and he's in Lake Mary, Florida. And I was like, well, that's not far from where I am. So a couple weeks later, I had to take a, um, take a trip to visit some friends on a motorcycle. To visit some friends, and on the way back, I swung by, I Googled the address, you know, swung by the place, that he, the kitchen he was working in, and just kind of like all full of bluster, like pulled out my resume and was like, oh, you gotta hire me, I wanna make candy, and I'll do anything, and I have nothing else going on in my life, and kind of gave him this spiel. And uh, he kind of looked at me, and I'm not sure if he blew me off or not, I didn't really know what to think. Um, so. I left and uh, I got a call about two hours later and he said, hey, I'm doing a demonstration in Orlando. Can you be there at eight o'clock in the morning tomorrow? And I was like, well, yes, I will be on the moon. So I showed up there. They were starting a new venture in Universal Studios. They needed people to, to help run that. I ended up hitting it off with the, the, the folks in charge and they taught me to make candy. And that was about eight years ago. So I was 21, I think, 20 to 29 now. So yeah, it's many moons ago. And I've been making candy professionally with almost no breaks ever since, at least in some, in some capacity, in some capacity. Although it's always a wild ride as a candy maker. Um, so yeah, so um, the, the, the guy that um, I worked with that taught me, he ended up um, leaving the company. The company ended up getting sold to some new folks and I was managing their production kitchen. And then something sad happened. The, the new folks that owned it were awesome, but they didn't have a vision for their company. They didn't have a really good knowledge of the industry. They didn't know exactly what it was they were selling, uh, and then they like to blame every everyone for everyone else, you know, everyone else for their own challenges. Um, and so I ended up watching this candy company that I had been at for several years just start to disintegrate. And in less than two years, it was pretty much gone. I was the last employee left. I would walk into the kitchen and be the only guy that wasn't an owner. Um, and so after that happened, it, it kind of stuck in my crawl because I felt like I could do this. Like, you know, it's whenever you watch someone like on TV, you know, like one of those reality shows and they're doing something really ridiculous, you know, like some silly challenge and like, and you kind of imagine yourself in that position, like how great you would be at it, you know, eating the spiders or whatever it is. That was how I felt. <laughs> I, it, it's like, it's like when you watch, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's how I felt. I watched him and I thought I could do that. So um, just as it was starting to end, I wasn't, I wasn't getting enough hours to even make rent. Um, I was about this far from living in my car, and my brother and I got to talking one day. I went to see the family, and he was making yo-yo strings in his dorm room with a Dremel tool, and he had his chairs arranged a certain way and a bunch of textbooks to add weight in certain places. It was a brilliant feat of engineering. However, <laughs> there was a problem with it. I, he was excited to sell me, oh, I traded 30 yo-yo strings for a yo-yo. Well, that's great. People, you people love my yo-yo strings. That's great, Bradley. So, um, however, I asked him how long it took to make the strings. He said, well, pretty much all day. How much is the yo-yo worth? About 20 bucks. Okay, so the numbers don't quite work out. But it got me thinking, and so we sat down, and um, we, we used his process to figure out how to build a machine, and I designed it and built this machine that basically manufactured yo-yo strings. It was about 11 feet long, it had a crazy sliding mechanism. Uh, it would pull 72 strands of polyester serger thread across it with a shuttle. It was this bizarre thing that we, we built and we started this little yo-yo company, or yo-yo string, snack time strings is what it was called. Yeah. And so we started this little yo-yo company. Oh, you got candy with every bag of yo-yo strings that you bought too. No, no joke, no joke, yeah. Wow, we would We would make this. Oh That's probably the reason why people even bought the yo-yo strings. <laughs> because we put the little logo, the little company logo in the, um, in, a, in the yo-yo string bags as well. So yeah, anyway, so we did that and it was, 
it was fun. It wasn't like you know a company that could actually like sustain you know employees and go for a long you know a long time. We had a a TAM of probably about a thousand people, maybe. I don't really know. We probably had 500 customers all told, but it was a lot of fun, and it kind of like I tasted blood at that point. At that point, I, I had this feeling like this is where I belong. This is the exact opposite feeling that I got from when I sat in a classroom learning about immunology. This is where I fit. And so, um, so I got a cool opportunity to move to our fair city of Tallahassee shortly after that. Through the yo-yo industry, we were going to yo-yo competitions and promoting our product. And basically, we'd use the strings to pay for gas money. And I would just show up because I had nothing better to do. Um, I didn't yo-yo and still don't. Um, so we, we, yeah, we, I just make the strings. So we, we, we got there and we met a guy um, from Tallahassee who was taking his business and turning it into a, um, kind of pivoting it from a toy store to something that served food. And well, I had food management experience and had connections to the oil industry. And so um, I ended up, he, he used to call me about every other week for about three or four months and say, hey, I mean, we need to come to Tallahassee. And finally I was like, all right, Every, everybody else had left the sinking ship of, of the company I was working for before, so I said, let's do it. So I came up here and I got a really cool, different perspective of, of entrepreneurship. Um, kind of being in a management role, working in an already established business um, that, was doing, that was pivoting really hard and do, going through a lot of changes. It was, it, was, uh, it was kind of fun because we got to kind of do something new every week, you know? Um, and so as I did that, I kind of, got a feel for, I think maybe the completed part, the part where you get to take crazy challenges that come up out of nowhere and say, okay, we're gonna address them this way or address these this way. Um, but there was, uh, I guess I was telling um, Vincent earlier, there wasn't quite enough room to grow there. And so uh, I was there for three years and eventually I was like, it's time to go do something else. And I had this itch to start my own candy company. It was the only thing I had industry specific knowledge in. It was my only marketable skill I used to tell people. And so in February of uh, um, 2013, we incorporated and then in April 1st, April Fool's Day, we made our first sale. And yeah, and then it's that, so that's, that's it. And then we never looked back. Yeah, I, I sold everything we owned pretty much like our cars, not everything, my, my racing bicycle, my cars, everything went. We took the money, we blew through that stack of cash in about two weeks. And then my wife and I looked at each other and said, all right, what are we gonna do now? <laughs> but that's just when the order started rolling in and so that was about a year and a half ago. Can we clap that up? Yeah. I mean, how often do you get like, that's real, that's real like, like stuff that you see on a movie type story. You know, seriously, like, I'm just out here, I'm gonna do my thing. Spend all my money, and then we get orders. Yeah, yeah. 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 exactly. It's interesting. No, that's great. Yeah. You gotta buy a lot of sugar at first. <laughs> we got the sugar. Um, I think the thing that inspired me the most about, you know, how you got started in your, in your beginnings is the fact that you always had like this sense of adventure. Did anybody else get that? Yeah. Like you always kept like this eye of adventure, like I can do that and I'm going to try this and I'm going to try that. He kind of tinkered his way through. And even when he was, I'm sure there was probably tight times when the money was low and all these other types of things that were going Gosh, on. Yes. <laughs> but at the exact same time, he's like, I'm just going to keep tinkering. I'm just keep doing my thing. And so now here we have you years later. Mm -hmm. In the mix, doing your craft, building your business, and this is where we launched. This is where we were talking about where you are now and where you plan okay. to go. Now, I remember there was a time because me and you were in the same um, entrepreneur excellence program. The EVP, yeah. So yeah, that was awesome stuff. Indeed, um, indeed. How many people in this room have been through the EVP? I've been through. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. do it, do it. No, it's awesome. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah. The deal. That's the deal. That's a gemstone here mm -hmm. in the city. Um, being able to go through there and get some insight. I've been an entrepreneur for a long time, and when I went through that program, my eyes were open to a lot of new things. And so it's always a good, you know, thing to go through and get sharpened up and, and refreshed. That's where I met Wes. And Wes, yeah. he had this. He had the same spirit of adventure in that class that he has, like right now. I mean, he's, his energy has not gone anywhere since I've met him. It's really, really awesome. Um, and so there was a time where you actually did like a crowdfunding because remember I said yeah. he does use technology. It's not like he's just always like in the kitchen. This guy uses technology and he uses it very, very clever in a very clever way. Tell us about your crowdfunding experience. 
Okay, so we did a Kickstarter. I want to talk about technology. Though. I don't know if you want to come back to this, this but we talked about something fun about technology. So I'm in an industry that is wow. about as old as, as humankind. Ever since like man <laughs> walked upright, somebody was trading an apple for a sharp rock. They was okay? And th yeah, no. And then the type of candy I make, I'm using 200 year old techniques to make this. This isn't you know, something that just got invented. This is a craft that's been around for hundreds of years. So, but it's really neat. Looking at the retail food industry, it's, it's like a giant tree that's a thousand years old, right? And if you cut a branch from that tree, you can, you can look at the rings in that branch and you can see how the weather was and all the different events that have happened over the life of that tree. And you can kind of look at the, the retail food industry in the same way. And it's amazing how refrigeration comes through. It's amazing how, you know, transportation comes through. It's amazing how flash freezing process, all, you know, the, the factors we have now and how they've impacted everything. But yet the, the value proposition is pretty much the same. And, and, but it's always in a different way and it's constantly being in, impacted. So for, through technology, that gives us an opportunity to kind of access senses of people that food has never really touched way far away. You can't taste food through your computer, but you can see it. So going back to our Kickstarter, it's the actual question you asked me. Cool. Um, for, the, for the Kickstarter, we kind of did that as a, as a way to expand and we, it was about 50% um, funding, 50% marketing for us. And so, you know, we got on the Kickstarter, we did a video and we found that people taste with their eyes. And so if you can give somebody a taste of their eyes, you know, with their eyes of the candy, through the Kickstarter, they're gonna get really interested. The other thing we learned too is people like stuff on their food. You know, you're, you, know you, you dip your chicken nuggets in the barbecue sauce, you put ketchup on your fries, you know, people like stuff on their food. People really like a compelling narrative on their food. Um, and that's something that we're seeing like in markets like Whole Foods and in, in Trader Joe's and Williams Sonoma, some of the, the more high-end markets, you're seeing that compelling narrative is, is a pretty good sauce for anything. And so Kickstarter was an awesome platform to do that. Now, um, I have kind of my own, you know, a lot of people have different kind of views of Kickstarter. To me, it's, a, it's kind of a, a glorified way to sell pre-orders. And it's a great tool, but it's also a double-edged sword. And when I was in Kickstarter, we, we needed $3,500. We were just, we were moving our kitchen and expanding it a little bit. We didn't need a whole lot, mostly for odds and ends and tables and stuff. Um, and so we put it out and we were funded in less than 24 hours, which was fantastic because, you know, we got another 29 days now to run this thing but I immediately stopped promoting it. And we, we tried to kind of push it into the corner. And it, you're looking at me askance, it sounds crazy. Why would you stop promoting your Kickstarter? Because at the end of the day, when you're in business, I'm really as confectionery. I'm a confectionery. And I need to do the things, I need to spend the time building and doing the things that are gonna make my business succeed. And so we did it in the end of 2013. In the year of 2014, had, had I raised, and uh, someone else, who had started a food-based Kickstarter around the same time I did, with about the same goals, ended up raising nearly two hundred thousand dollars from with marshmallows, handmade marshmallows, and so they were going to be supplying those Kickstarter rewards the whole year, pretty much, because of how small they were originally. And I didn't want to be in that business. I wanted to be creating with relationships with Whole Foods. You know, I wanted to be creating relationships with Chex Distribution and Mouth Foods in New York and partners that are not going to be just a one-off crowdfund, but, but are what the, the nuts and bolts, the bread and butter of my business is. And so I think some people do lose sight of in Kickstarters. Funding is awesome, but don't, don't act like you're a company that is in the business of running Kickstarters, unless you are. In that case, great. But, <laughs> but, but make sure that you understand that you're a company that's in the business of doing Whatever, whatever your competitive competency is, whether it's making candy or marshmallows or writing apps or coming up with a weird drink that supplies all your nutritional needs, whatever that, you know, whatever it is. Wow, that's interesting. How many people have ever heard that perspective of Kickstarter before? Raise your hand, because this is my first time. I've never heard it before, where it could be a double-edged sword because yeah. you're in the business of making candy, but you've now done this Kickstarter campaign mm -hmm. where you've got to supply all of this candy to all right. these people for this one-time order. Yeah. That could kill business. And it was really, wow. it was interesting to watch this marshmallow company and, and us kind of go through this more or less parallel and, um, and it, it, it turned out better for us than it did for them in the long run. So. Wow. And, and, and you know we're still thirty five hundred dollars instead of two hundred thousand. Yeah, yeah. It's not all. I, I think a lot of folks 
This is a tangent I like to get on. A lot of folks get really fixated on money. And you talked about my kind of like sense of adventure, right? right, right. When, when things were really hard, you know, when I was going through like the yo-yo string thing and I was, you know, this close to sleeping in my car, all these different things. Uh, my first night in Tallahassee, I didn't have a place to stay. I, was, I almost slept in All Saints. The co- I almost slept in the coffee shop across the street. Yeah. People spend a lot of money to buy fun or to feel like they're doing something really compelling, to feel like they're, they're, they're just living life and they're really experiencing it in a really full way. And so if you're getting that without spending all, if you're getting that through your business, through your entrepreneurial activities, that's great. You can, you can focus, you can kind of think about the money as something that is good for the long term as a tool, just like Kickstarter. The money's a tool. Money's a tool to buy resources. If you have a, need, a, a direct need and a reason for a specific amount of resources, then you need the money to get that. But if you don't have a need for a specific resources, then you don't need the money and you shouldn't be going after the money. Um, it's kind of like, like spending money too, it goes both ways. You know, every time I tell my wife, every time I spend the dollar, I look at the dollar and I ask it, what are you going to do when I let you go? I have raised you, I have cultivated you, you are my little George Washington here, and I'm gonna send you on, and I need to know exactly why that's taking place. Because it's not about seeing $200,000 in your bank account versus 3,000, it's about what you're doing. Wow, interesting, you just flipped money on its head. <laughs> yeah. Is, I'm like, yeah. Is don't, so don't, cool. show this, don't show this in California. Yeah. This is so cool. This is so cool. But you know, and I think that that perspective is a unique and really, really interesting perspective coming from someone again, because that's why I call this developing of a craft, old school entrepreneurship, yo-yos. And K- Does everybody understand why I call it that now? Because he's talking about the fundamental things about business, like the core stuff, like managing money. Like, not trying to just raise a whole bunch of them just for the sake right. of raising it, but why? You know, always asking those, compel- those compelling questions. And I think that's really, really, really cool. How are some of the other ways, like we talked about Kickstarter, how are some of the other ways that you've actually used technology to advance your business? Um, or to, in your world, yeah. now, what I'm starting to figure out is build better relationships. Because you build, like, awesome relationships. Yeah, well that's, I mean, I, I use technology to do that. That's, technology is awesome for relationships. Um, yeah, people, you know, like, like I said, uh, people love candy with some sauce on it of a compelling narrative, and technology is a great way to access people to, to kind of get, it's, it's a, the technology market is almost a story market in a lot of ways. I mean, that's why Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all of those things don't exist so that you can, uh, I shouldn't say they don't exist, they're, they're not followed. People don't log on to them because to hear about like your, your next deal or that you're doing 25% off to be marketed to. They log on because they want to hear a story because, I mean, this, this, is, this is caveman entrepreneurship right here. We're, we're going way down. People want to sit around the campfire and hear a story because they can take themselves and they can put themselves just like, um, you know, when I was watching those people, I love terrible entrepreneurs. I love stories of failure. They're my favorite kind of stories. Mm-hmm. But you take yourself and you put yourself there and you, you kind of imagine yourself in that story. And like when I was imagining myself running this previous candy company, you know, it, a lot, you make a lot of connections in your head and it's, it fires you up, you get interested, you want to go back. Every time you watch a TV show, you, you know, if it's like whatever is going on right then, you want to see the next episode. You want to binge watch. You don't even want to wait now. You want to like see it immediately. And so we use, the, we use the story as kind of something that technology is just a vector for. Mm-hmm. And story being the actual important thing. And uh, I'm preaching to myself right now because I don't do that enough. You know, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to be in a manufacturing business, which is very not story-based with most of the people around. And so remember that that's why people are buying your candy. It's because they like your story and they want, and that makes it taste better. Also, it's highly quality candy mm-hmm. and it's all natural and it looks great. <laughs> people taste with the eyes first. It looks great. Yeah, it looks awesome. Exactly. Um, <clears throat> on the story, can we ask questions? Yeah, go for it. Um, you know, I think I picked up on that you do specialty candies for different, sure. you, know, you know, businesses. Yeah. And so, you know, it's their story too that you're telling. Wow. Yeah. And the fact that you can t- help them tell their story mm-hmm. of why they've got such a, a sweet deal f- for the customer. Yeah. Then you're connecting with their story. Yeah. And pe- people really like the idea. Mm-hmm. People like the idea of networks of artisans. So there's a, a bakery called Persephone Bakery uh, that we just, 
they're one of our newest um, retailers, and they wanted something that was going to kind of like fit with, with what they're doing. So we made some candy peppermint sticks. They look like normal peppermint sticks, right? But they have, they're, it's two like uh, wheat sh shocks or whatever, like he heads of wheat kind of thing. And we put that inside all the way through the peppermint stick. Um, and so that's something that like when someone picks one of those up, they're going to look at it and they're going to be like, oh my gosh, there's that thing. And then all of a sudden it's to see something unusual, like that's kind of how you need a story. You know, you need to, to be able to say, so there I was in this crazy situation or so there it was inside of a peppermint stick. And then when the, the customers were browsing, it's a small little bakery, you know, we, we, most of our uh, retailers are quite small. Um, they pick that, that stick up, that's something we've never seen before. That's an opportunity for a story. And we kind of push our story on media so that Persephone can talk about making handmade artisan bread. They could talk about the relationship that one artisan who does, who operates in this sphere, has with another artisan. They can, they can kind of, you know, get people excited about the idea that, that there's a network of, of folks doing things by hand mm -hmm. um, as well. And um, gosh, another thing about story, that you mentioned it, that's kind of on a very organic level. That's like a, a natural, it just happens. No one really forces that to happen. It's just inherent in the product. Um, one thing we're seeing now in the food industry, especially the handmade food industry, is, and it's kind of a, it's, it's an up and coming trend. I don't know if it's a fad or not, we'll see. But everybody is doing these meet the maker websites. And there's some really good ones out there. Um, uh, Mouth.com has been carrying our stuff. They're one of our first major retailers. And they have a blurb, you know, they ask a bunch of questions and they have a, a bio on a little page about me and my entrepreneurship story. And there's a lot of what I told you in there. There's, a, you know, just kind of anecdotes and stuff. So people feel like they're in the kitchen. And then um, another one, Treat Seed, is they ask all kinds of weird questions. Like, which, how, do you, how do you cook steak? How do you like your steak done? So I like, in my bio, there's like a whole recipe for how I like to like cook steak on a cast iron. And I don't know why that makes somebody connect and want to purchase, but it does. Um, and it's, and these, these sites that tell maker stories are popping up like crazy, and I think the market's going to get saturated pretty soon. But there's a few really high quality ones. Mm -hmm. I, I just, you know, part of our networking here, we've got a hammerman here. Sure. Who puts together those stories for businesses. Yeah. This is this is a huge this is a huge part of it. Yeah. This is this is a very significant part. I'm actually taking a bunch of notes on that right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you're talking about <laughs> after the meeting. You know, and, and Instagram, I hadn't figured out. I, I have like a mom adoption tier. Like whenever your mom adopts a new technology, that's when I adopt it. So <laughs> mom adoption tier. Yeah, that's I'm on the mom level. I'm on the mom level. Like there's there's the, the whatever it is is it the, the, the Mavens and the Connect Girl and Gladwell's little tiers. I'm on the mom level. But um, I just got an Instagram and I, I because I didn't get one because I didn't know what to do with it. I was like, what, what do I do with an Instagram? Oh wow. And so I got an Instagram and I figured out what I'm gonna do with it. It is gonna be a day in the life of a candy maker and people that follow that are gonna basically get a shot of what I do about every few hours, every time it's something different, wherever my hands are. And it's very POV with kind of just the hands in, in the sugar. And we'll see, I don't know if people are gonna like it or not. It's, uh, we've had it for all of 24 hours, so it's one day on there. <laughs> I think, um, I wanna talk to you a little bit after, cause I'm glad you went down that rabbit hole. I'll talk to you yeah. later about some ideas on that. But being able to tell the story and, and to meet the maker, I, I don't think that that's a, and this is just my own opinion in the mix of all this, I don't think that it's a fad. I don't think it's going away. I mm -hmm. think that the consumer sentiment oh, no. is starting to shift. And so what, sure. they're, what they're starting to do is, because we've had so much abundance for so long. Matter of fact, I think I was watching the movie, um, and this is not to give the movie props, whatever the movie was good. I think the movie is Interstellar. Watching it with the <laughs> Awesome movie. Um, but there's a part in there where it talked about like the abundance and just so much that people actually went back to wanting less. And I think we're getting back there, and I think we're getting back to the old craftsmanship, like make me something. There's the company, um, Dodo Case, I think they're out in California. Mm -hmm. When they actually went back and they bought old book binding back and actually made cases for, um, for the iPad, which was really, really cause like this is like old school stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and I admired that. And so with food yeah. and being able to put your hands back on it and say mm -hmm. some, a human being made this thing, and it's not yeah. about just an app or it's not just about mass, it's about craftsmanship. I think we're going back there. So yeah, I think absolutely. there's tons of opportunities absolutely. in the craftsmanship. Area. Absolutely. It's, it adds a huge amount of, of value because when you eat the candy, you know, it's like, like you were saying, there's a, 
<laughs> just, just imagine, imagine all the things in your house, and if you had to move into a, a tiny, tiny, like let's say you were gonna move into a ship, my shipping container right there, right? You got, you got three, you got 300 square feet to work with, right? What would you take? It would only be the things that were handmade. If it was like made in China or made, you know, or I'm not saying that anything's wrong with being made in China, but if it was something that was mass produced, that wasn't special, that you could easily wow. pick, pick it up, it wouldn't be that important. You wouldn't take it with you. And I think we're, I think you're right. I think we're gonna see people start to move to smaller scale living just because of how close we live together now. Mm -hmm. And because of that, the things that they do own are going to be much more important to them. Absolutely. So yeah, I, I didn't want to. I didn't want to classify that as a fat at all. Oh no. no yeah. No, I agree with that. You said I agree yeah. with that. Like, how many people in this room agree with that? Go ahead. Let's go, yeah. ahead, let's go ahead and make a statement right now. Right. So when it happens, we can all say we're in a room. We we do it. We do it. It's we gotta happen. Think of that on tape. Yeah. So this is good stuff. Um, is there anything else? Because right now, like I said, there's over a hundred chapters with Startup Grind all over the world here in this story. And I'm hoping that it inspires other people right. just like it's inspiring me. If you could tell them anything, what, what would it be? What would you tell them? Man, I would... Gosh, that's... I'm going to tell what you need because you're about to do it. I know, I'm about to tell like... About to do it right now. Yeah, yeah. I would say, um... Uh... Gosh, that's a tough... That's, a, that's such a heady question. Oh, yeah, it is. Um... <laughs> Your spine. Nice. Thank you. Yeah. One, one, one thing. No, I would say go out and do it. And by going out and doing it, I mean if you have an idea and a passion and the and the the money, you know, you're you're worried about this or that or this or that excuse or lack of resources or whatever. I like to quote the, the Calvin and Hobbes book. There's treasure buried everywhere. I don't know what kind it is. I don't know if it's applicable, but it's everywhere. Um, and then also do it as far as make the relationships because. We talked about relationships as part of like, you know, people want to buy the candy, they want to have a relationship with the candy maker. Well also, as a business person, beyond just a candy maker, the relationships that I have, that have kind of made my business grow and work, they've been, they've been really deep and really meaty. Um, there's a lot of different levels you can have of relationships and like, I, you know, I love my LinkedIn and you know, I have followers on Twitter, but there's the people who I have been able, who have like, my inter their interactions have been pivotal to my success. Their relationship has been on a different type of level. It's been on a, a relationship of like kind of shared interests and shared passions. If someone else is passionate about the same things that you are, go just orbit them all the time, you know, or they're passionate in the same way that you are because that's, that, that's what makes or breaks, I think, a, a business, especially one that's very like niche and very just starting out. Um, you know, my relationship with Jeff and I was able to, you know, get that shipping container going. I have no idea how to make a shipping container. Someone gives me a plasma <laughs> torch and a bunch of corrugated steel. <laughs> I'm probably gonna kill myself, <laughs> you know? But um, just getting into Whole Foods, you know, the, the, the buyers, um, you know, we were, and one of the things I kind of glossed over is we were able to get Whole Foods as a, as a customer, all the Whole Foods in Florida, which was super paramount to us. And that came about because of some relationships that I actually was able to create during the uh, EEP class. Because mm -hmm. we were all passionate about entrepreneurship. We were all together. We were, we were all orbiting each other. We were all throwing ideas back and forth. And then I was able to get, get connected with somebody who was connected with somebody who was connected with Whole Foods. And the information, just getting in front of one of those buyers, man, getting your card on their desk or their card on your desk, that is difficult. Mm -hmm. And so, to, because there's a, it's a very crowded market, one of the difficult things about being in an industry that's been around since the existence of humankind is that there's a lot of players. There's been a lot of players, there will be a lot of players, and there's always a lot of players. So that was something that that relationship kind of gets. So I would say just go, go out, go out and do it, whether it's trying, trying to kind of assemble resources, figure out the resources you have, and create the relationships, if, you know, and it's fun. You gotta have fun with it. Wow. Can everybody feel this energy? Like, does this seem like he has fun doing what he's doing? Because I have fun eating his candy, I'm just saying. <laughs> but I mean, I mean, it just seems like you have a lot of fun doing what you're doing, which is I highly admirable. It. I love it. It's, it's a blast. Good stuff. What I'm going to do is open up the floor for questions. If you guys have questions, throw it at him. I know he's ready for them. Um, and let's see what, what kind of answers he gives us. Anybody have questions? Yeah, go ahead. Well, a comment and a question. Sure. A comment first. Just Way smarter than a lot of my friends who are in college. Um, <laughs> I can just tell. And well, you know, I went back and got a degree. Like through all that, I forgot to mention, I got, I did get a degree in business administration with a focus on finance. I know, yeah. Th th through all that. 
that's gonna be bad if I ever try to go in the financial sector. They don't Google me. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I, I did go back. Sorry, what were you gonna say, else? What was and, uh, your question? So apparently, at one point on your bike, you didn't know anything about candy, but you said you were gonna stop whatever you were doing and get yeah. into business. Yeah, yeah. Luckily, it was delivering pizza, so it was really the exit strategy of delivering pizza is pretty minimal. <laughs> yeah. <I> quit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exit strategy. It involves spelling out things with mushrooms. No, I'm just kidding. How did you know, like, oh, candy? Like, how did you even? Know? You know what? I don't. I don't even know. You know, I think it was the fact that I had been wondering since I was probably in middle school. People have been asking me, "What do you want to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do?" And I just, I, I, I couldn't come up with an answer. I, I had never been able to answer that question ever, um, because it's such a like. You know how I got when you asked me that one really nebulous yeah. but but important question. That's how I felt about what do you want to do. And so when I decided to make candy, it wasn't because I think there was anything inherent in candy. And sometimes I lay awake at night thinking about all the other things that I could have gotten into because candy is it's one of the most difficult industries to be in and make money. I kind of feel like if I can keep Rayleigh's confectionery alive, like I could do anything because it's, the market is just really, really wild and the competition is ridiculously fierce and there's a lot of players that have been around since before my grandparents were born and that know their stuff really well. Um, so I, but I just decided something. It was just kind of, it wasn't even that anything was good about candy. It was just that I was sick of not having that direction. And I think like, you know, sometimes you can worry so much about your opportunity costs. Like, oh, if I pick candy, I can't pick being a baker or I can't pick being a welder or I can't pick this. That sometimes you just have to pick something and say, I'm going to latch on because I don't have anything else. To, to worry about, and I'm gonna, and any, everything else that I thought I could have done, I'm gonna forget about it. And I'm just gonna latch onto this one thing and try it. I don't know if that's a recommendation, that's a good thing to do, but that's what I did. Wow, that's pretty powerful, that's conviction. I mean, yeah, you've been there where you were like, you, you basically dove into something and then you found out you didn't like it. Like, yeah, you know, I, I never did, did dove it in, I think. Like when I was in school the first time around, um, you know, my parents, were, they were kind of like doing, what was the common wisdom? Like, yeah, this is the right thing to do. You know, your kid needs to go to school. He's smart, this and that. I kind of got like ushered into it, you know. It was like, you know, when it was time to write call, application essays, like I ended up at, at UCF because it was the only place that would take me because I didn't write any essays, you know. Not because I was a slacker or inherently lazy, but just because I, I, did never, I never chose to do it really. I don't know if that makes sense, yeah. but. Yeah, some existential stuff. So as Rayleigh's grows and gets bigger, are you going to continue to do handmade artisan stuff or do you see yourself starting to like kind of farm some of this out or have machines start to do part of this process? That's a good question. That's a good question. Um, yes to all those things. <laughs> um, so there are some things that are part of my, the uniqueness of my candy that has has got to be done by hand. There's not really a machine for it. However, we're looking very closely at scalability. Um, and in fact, this is gonna be relevant to like two people in the world, but um, it, you guys might find it fascinating. The, the type of candy that I make is called cut rock in England. It's called lollies in Australia. Um, it all but died out when the Industrial Revolution hit because nobody could figure out a good way to mass produce it. So we went from eating handmade candy like this to just little drops and you know pieces that you kind of see in a, a bag of Skittles or what have you. Um, in like the, I think it was like the 1980s, 1990s, some dudes from Australia started making it. Their business went through the roof. They, they, I think they were backpacking in England, if I remember the story correctly. Saw the stuff, thought it was cool, went back to Australia, started doing it there. there it spawned probably seven or eight small companies, and now you can find a lolly maker, they call it, in almost any town in Australia. It's a huge boom. But it was, a, it was kind of a tourism thing where people would come in and you'd make it in front of them, you'd do a show. I, I've done that in Universal Studios before for a couple years. Um, and that, you know, that's really fun, it's really neat, but it's not very scalable. You know, because you got one location in every major city and then you need to train people up. And one of, one of the issues that, um, that the company that I, work, I used to work for ran into is they couldn't keep highly trained people there. Like, I've been making candy for eight years. I can make anything in candy. I did a bride and a groom's face. If I pull a guy in, it's gonna take me a couple years just to, just to get him to that level. So I have to kind of like think about the business, not from the context of my own skills and expertise, but from the context of like what makes a good business and what makes it scalable. And just kind of work in the numbers. You know, I can either live in a, a touristy area and work like uh, the tourist beat, you know, which I've done for years and it's great, but I, I've got a wife, I've got two kids now. I want to be able to go on vacation sometimes. I don't want to be working every single Christmas Eve. 
you know, things like that. So we're taking a different tack. No, no one else that has, is doing this cut rock type of candy is, is doing what I'm doing. I'm the only company in the US that I know of that wholesales to retailers. There's a couple other that, that do very, very limited online sales, but I'm the only one that is on the shelves of any, any grocery stores anywhere. So um, yeah, so we're trying a whole different way and we're gonna try to scale it up. And there's actually, I'm gonna get candy nerd here in a second. There, so while this was all going on, some people started that were in Australia started making candy in Singapore and Taiwan and Indonesia and it's really blowing up there right now. Like it's going through the roof. You can get this candy at 7-Eleven in Singapore now. Um, and it's funny because we can trace like who taught who all the way back. Like we share lineage with all of them. It's really neat. It's kind of a fun part of the story. Um, that like, like, like everybody, everybody that's in the US that's doing it was taught by the guy who taught the guy who taught me. Or somewhere in that. There's like three, it's like my candy grandfather. They're, they're all, they're, they're, we're all candy cousins. <laughs> The kid, the, the kid, yeah, the kid. That's, 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 that's what it's like. That's what it's like. So since they started doing all this in Singapore, they started making some machinery that, that can make this now. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to make the candy. Don't don't disappoint the candy. Don't disappoint the candy. But, that is so cool. So now there's there's machinery now that can do this, and it's been on the market for about six months. The, the good stuff. There's always been some basic machinery, and there's been a couple companies who have played with that, but the good stuff just hit the market, so I want some. So, so I mean, how was that? Because I feel in my business is kind of the same thing. I do a lot of this, right? Bringing in somebody else who can do it sure. to the same level of quality now is an issue. That is challenging. That is challenging. Yes. So how um, you kind of went through that or worked through that? Yeah. So, um, so this is something one of my professors at FAM told me, and it was like one of the things that has stuck with me. I tell it to all my employees, but the product is only as good as the process used to make it. That means you can't make something good with a bad process. And so we're, um, I'm working on that. That's, that's super challenging. Um, I got inspired by, um, by Ikea a little while ago. You ever been in the back of an Ikea? Like it's seen like the, you know, kind of poked your head around and look where the employees are. <laughs> There's flow charts everywhere. Yeah. And it's like, nobody has to ask, what do I do? Because it's like on the wall all the time. And so I, I've, I've played with some flow charts just to kind of get things going. I'm learning that though. That, that's, that is, that's the school of hard knocks I'm in right now is getting the employees. And I have an awesome crew. Like they're all phenomenal. But it's, it is, it's been challenging. We've just now gotten to the point. It takes a person about six months to get to the point now where I can bring someone in cold and have them to the point where like I can say, okay, I can sell candy that you made at Whole Foods now. Um, and that's a long time. And we had, a, we had an employee turnover that I had just gotten. She was, she was really pro. And she got a much better job. Someone was going to pay her more than twice what I was paying her to do something relevant to her degree. And so it was like, well, I can't. She came in and told me I was gonna, she was going to quit. And I said, I'm sad, but that's not a bad idea. You know, go, do, go follow your dreams. Go do what you need to do. <laughs> that's great. No, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just want to tie, you were talking about the flow charts and mm -hmm. how important it is so everybody knows what they're doing. Yeah. And I'll just. Billy McCluskey's in the other room in here, and he's got an app. And a I've played with it. I've played with it. Yep, proper channel. So yep. I think that, you know, I'm here, you've got your process, and you've got to really mm. optimize that. You're running a garden. You know, you've got to make that garden be as productive mm -hmm. as, as possible. So that's yep. a piece of it. Um, but and the candy making is kind of your specialty. But I think the other thing that I'm hearing is that you have developed these relationships with the commercial groceries. Yes, that, those are highly important. Something else that you said was that you really have to understand kind of them. You know, oh, what yes. What are their yes. values? What, yes. How do they see the world? Uh, you know, mm -hmm. and, and so that you're, to build a partnership has got to be mm -hmm. based mm -hmm. on their interest and your interest yep. and how they fit together. Yeah, you absolutely so, have to understand the industry. How do you fit with these? Uh, you know, grocery so, seller. So um, in the context of Whole Foods, because I'm different in every, in a lot of the smaller boutique places, it's kind of different. For, um, for Whole Foods, which is probably the most normal, I guess, situation I have, um, I'm the most expensive non-chocolate candy on the shelf. So when you walk down the aisles of Whole Foods, it's Annie's Organics, which just got bought by GE for $2 billion. So yeah, small, small food companies can scale. Um, 
you have, uh, not GE, um, General Mills. Anyhow, um, you see surf suites. There's a, there's a handful of other, other small time, and I'm the most expensive. But what, what they want is they want their planograms to, 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 bring, to bring like certain things to the customer, right? First off, you gotta make money. The, 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 it's gotta turn. Like what you have on your shelf has gotta turn. That's what they're, they're thinking in their head. Gotta turn. It's got to have a certain, it's got to like be an ambassador of our brand. So like Whole Foods, I might be, a, I don't, I'm probably not, but I might be a loss leader to Whole Foods. In fact, I've gotta be. Because if they are gonna look at it strictly on money per inches of shelf space, I'm a loss leader. I, I, I'm, they, they could put, they could have, get a higher margin product in there, but then they'd be Walmart. And they don't wanna be Walmart, they wanna be Whole Foods. Mm. So my candy does, it, it brings like cachet. It's my, mine's the only candy that where the package is clear. And all the Whole Foods are all opaque packaging with, with pictures and artwork and what have you. Mine, you see the actual candy itself. That brings a, a feeling when you walk by the aisle in Whole Foods that you're in a higher, that you're not in Publix, that you're not in Winn-Dixie, you're not in Walmart. You know, so it's, it's little things like that, that kind of like, that, like, like buyers, they look at a very holistic picture. You know, they, they'll look at, how does it, does, is this us? Does this fit with us? So one of the things that I did when I was looking forward to doing that is I just took pictures. I have like a folder of pictures of, of uh, candy aisles, like from all different grocery stores, just to get a feel for like, what does this feel like, you know, in, in my, you know, it, if, if I'm gonna like pretend to be a regional buyer for Whole Foods, right? What does this feel like? And then also Whole Foods wants stories on their shelves because that's their marketing. I'm not calling up Walmart, I'm not calling up Publix at least anytime soon um, because they, have, they need different things. So you do wanna understand your specific customer because they're all different. I and mean, the other thing is they, they do store resets in June, so you gotta get, I mean everybody does. It's the slowest season of the year, so Groceries operate on a yearly cycle. So you, in the summer, you get your product, you know, developed. Through the fall, you get, you, you, you test it, you, you make sure that you're selling it to someone because you don't want your first, you know, the first rocket that NASA ever sent up didn't have a guy in it, you know? You don't wanna, you don't wanna do your very first, like, push to like a major retailer because that relationship can only happen one, it only goes one way. You only get one shot at that. So you do that for like your fall, see how you handle Christmas, see what that all looks like. And then in February, you start making the phone calls, you start knocking on doors and seeing like, where can this go from here? And then they, and they blow you off until March. And then in March, they're like, oh my gosh, on the double, on the double, we need things now. And then they do their store resets in June and they want, they want product in June and July, generally speaking. So that's how most grocery stores work. I, don't, I hope that was. But you have to understand. You have their, to know their that. cycles, their systems, their mm -hmm. you know how they make their decisions. Yep. And you just you, just you can't Google that. You know. I mean, <laughs> it's really like there is no information on the internet. If you want to like create an app and market it, you can Google that all day long. But if you want to be in the food industry, there's a lot that you can't really Google. Um, that you have to actually get out there and talk to people and sit down and just be like, so what's it like? You know, or just. Try to leave space, you know, you know I'm, a, I'm, a cra I'm a crazy talker, so I have to like channel all my effort, mm -hmm. Vincent, to leave space for the folks that I'm gonna learn from to teach me things. Yeah. Awesome. It's Herculean. <laughs> there you go. Does anybody else have any questions? Yeah. Um, is your brother some, is your brother involved in the business? Or is no, he's not a, like he's wired totally different than I am. He's super cool, but yeah, he's not, he's not involved at all. Um, he, actually, he might be starting to get the entrepreneurial bug, but um, he codes in Tampa. I think he does mostly like PHP and CSS and things like that. Do you have another partner in the business, or is it just you? Just me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. And so like, the windows that you're gonna have in front, is that where you're saying people will be able to come right yeah. by at any time and watch a community yeah. made? Mm -hmm. so that, what do you think that will do for your business? Because it seems like that would be. I don't know. So, you know, we don't, I don't make any money in Tallahassee. There's 200,000 people in Leon County, right? Mm -hmm. That's just not enough people are gonna be interested in candy to, to pay my rent, or even close. So, 
we do things, you know, when we're, when we're doing something for marketing, it needs to be applicable to worldwide. However, Tallahassee, I love Tallahassee. My heart is in Tallahassee. I, um, I chose to, when I was going to start this business, I was thinking about leaving and I chose to stay here. I want to do some really cool events where people come. Tallahassee has an awesome time. I have, no one knows this, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to bust it open right now. I have this awesome idea that I'm going to be doing hopefully close to Christmas. Um, as a, because we're going to be in this kind of dark area where there's not a lot of light, we're going to do one night shut off all the lights. We're going to find some dyes. And they, this probably won't, won't be all natural, like I'm imagining, that make the candy glow under a black light. I'm going to paint my face, and then we're going to get some gloves that glow under black light. So can you imagine a disembodied head and two floating hands making this ridiculously you know, fluorescent glowing candy? And, and then we promote it. And then, hey, you want to you film it? You want to film it? Yeah, exactly. And, um, and then we'll, we'll mic up and we do, like, because I've done candy shows for so long, I have kind of a comedy routine that can go with a batch of candy. Um, you know, and so we're planning on doing something like that, you know, to get it. I, I really want to do candy making lessons. Last year I, I got on some foodie forums and would post about, like, you know, give people tips on making their own candy canes and stuff. And I'd like to do a... Uh, because I don't sell candy canes. Like but people want, people want handmade candy canes. That's why you need to do Cut Rock Academy. Would you guys go Cut Rock Academy? Yeah. Cut Rock Academy. <laughs> Made it good. Hey, that's a business. Mike, write yeah. it down. You got, you got to work down. Let's go. You, you got to help me. I do consult things, so. Yeah. Tell me. Thank you all for coming. There you go. Okay. Boom. Okay. Come on. All right. Boom. 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 Hey, it's happening. Let's get it going. We just made a business. <laughs> but, but you know what? <laughs> this is how it happens. The, uh, um, but there's one thing I want to talk about because I keep writing this down over and over and over because I know we've thought about doing the idea of actually doing brand candy. Like you can actually put a brand inside of candy. Sure. How much of that do you do? So it's really interesting. Um, when I did the, I'm going to go on for another tangent, but it's going to be a good one, I hope. Mm -hmm. um, when we did the, the coffee thing, I talked about beachhead markets. And it's what you do when you're very first starting your company and you just, you just sold all your cars mm -hmm. and you, know, you just went through all your savings and your wife is wondering how she's going to buy groceries. And so you, you look at these markets that are immediately accessible, that don't necessarily need to be scalable, but that, that you can use to kind of like vet your processes and your products. Yes. So for us, custom candy was a big part of that. Now, um, you need some expertise to do custom candy. And so I'm the only one who can do custom candy. You, you need to have years of experience. There's, um, there's a tradition of people you know, in England, because they used to do, custom candy's been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. They used to do stuff in England, and it was a lifetime thing. Like you, would, you would learn it when you were young, and then that was what you would do until you were, you were old, you know, and, until you're ready to retire. And so I don't think that that's very scalable, so we're probably gonna start doing it less and less, actually. That was a big part of my revenue when we started out, because it was something that I could do, I could make something beautiful for somebody, and I might just keep raising the prices. See, you know, see who really wants the exclusivity of a trained candy artisan, of whom there are very few in the world, making their logo in a candy. I can sell the crap. But you can bring the Starbucks. Look, I said, I can sell the crap. I'm bringing the candy. Yeah. Oh, no. When I, um, Amazon, you need your logo in the candy. Yeah. Right now. How much you got? $400. <laughs> what's, what's that? It would have to be like, what he's saying, like a big order for a big company that can yeah. pay the money. At the point when I'm making custom candy, it doesn't matter even if it's a big order. My, my minimums are actually really small because it just doesn't matter. Because if I'm doing a big order, I'm getting my crew and I'm like, I'm writing them down their, their day and I'm saying, okay, you guys are doing watermelon, then we're doing emojis, then we're gonna make a bunch of you know, raspberry in the evening. We do awesome emoji candy. It's great. Yeah. I just want one logo. I mean, I'm calling somebody right now. Your logo would look great in this candy. How much is it, Ben? Feel free to do it. Yeah, you can mark it up as much as you like uh, if you want to you know, get in the retail aspect. We, we just did a... Uh, Write it down, Mike. Yeah. 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 There we go. Oh, wait, one second. Yeah. Good stuff, guys. I don't know about you, but I'm inspired. This is like real deal. Get your hands dirty. Get in the mix. Build something that matters type business. And I'm like so appreciative. That you took the time to actually do Thanks, it. thanks for having me out here, man. This is a lot of fun. I it up. Did I look like I was having fun? <laughs> and you look like I had some fun. I don't know about you. We're going to talk to you guys. Absolutely. Absolutely. I just want to thank each of you. You know,
know, for coming out tonight. This is a small group. I actually love it. I wish I could get like a bunch of small groups. Don't, don't tell <laughs> Derek that. Derek, I didn't say it, <laughs> but I did. Small groups are awesome. You guys are phenomenal, and I'm glad you guys took the opportunity to actually come in here once to tell a story because I think that it's an important story. And if you're trying to start your business, I know you're trying to get yours off the ground. You doing something? So yeah. There you go. You in the mix. I always see you in the grind. You guys doing stuff. If this don't inspire you, I don't know what will. You know what I'm saying? This dude has sold his cars and everything. He's getting busy. Um, and I've seen Wes, and he's been growing, and, and he continues to grow. And I do want to talk to you about some different things that you mentioned because I got some ideas for okay. you. Okay. Um, but this has been phenomenal, and again, just want to thank everybody. So let's clap it up one more time.